Okay, let's pray together. God, you are with us. We sense your presence. You said that when just a couple of us, few of us would gather, you'd be here. So we don't just invite you in. You are already among us and speaking to us from the moment we came on this campus. And now you are inviting us into your word to speak a truth to us that will change us. So Lord, I pray that every person here, myself included, Lord, that we will hear from you. I pray you'll help me to get out of the way so your word might be heard, not only heard, but applied into every life. And I pray that we'll never be the same. So Lord, speak as we listen. In your name we pray, amen. Hey, grab your Bible and go ahead and turn to the book of Luke. Uh, I wanna extend my welcome to you as as well. We're so glad that you're here, especially guests. I'd love to meet you. Uh, If you brought a friend today, I'll be in the narthex, the foyer back in the back after the service. Would love to meet you, all of you online. We're so glad that you're here today. Of course, this is that time where uh, we're getting a lot of invitations to a lot of parties. We had a great time this past Thursday night with our senior adults, filled the great hall, hundreds of us here, just a magical night celebrating Christmas together. Some of you have been in uh, some connect group parties, perhaps, Stacey and I trying to make all the parties. Have you gotten any unexpected invitations, maybe some unexpected Christmas cards this year? Years ago, when my kids were turning 13 um, years old, kind of a coming of age, I decided I was going to take each one on a trip, do something special with each one. When Travis was 12, my son, I have twin daughters, and, and then he came uh, third along the way. I said, hey, Travis, where would you want to go? Like, just father, son, just you and me. And he said, uh, well, I, I think D.C. would be fun, like Washington, D.C. I said, that, that would be amazing. That's a great place to go. Let's do it. I said, what do you want to see? Like, why do you want to go to D.C.? He said, well, they, they have pandas. I said, they, they, got pa- they have pandas. Yeah. And he said, they have the zoo. They have pandas. I said, that would be awesome. Let's go see the pandas. You know, but there's a lot more in D.C. Like, you could, we could go see. Like, the Capitol and all this. And he knew some of this, but he's like, let's go see the pandas. We got to go see the pandas. But in the weeks coming up to that, really months preparing for that trip, um, I wanted to have some men in his life who were in his life at the time, family members and others, and men that were just discipling him and speaking into his life to, um, to write notes to him, write letters. So all these guys write letters. I put them in a notebook with pictures of Travis and I together through the years, just a real special father-son kind of thing. And I, I wanted to give it to him when we got there in D.C. Well, one of the men um, who knew that you know, we were doing this and I'd asked to write a letter, he said, hey, I've got a, a daughter who is a member uh, of a church there and and one of, the, one of her good friends is uh, the White House chef. And I'm going to check to see if y'all might be able to get in the White House. I said, the, what? He said, yeah. And they weren't doing tours at this time. Like this, it was, I mean, it's locked down. And he said, yeah, I'll check. So we, we, long story short, we get an unexpected invitation from the chef in the White House to come into the White House. And so we go, we go to the security gate there and we did all the things. I had to go through a congressman to get clearance, all these things. And we get there and sure enough, the, 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 the chef comes out. She comes out with a, with a white outfit on, white hat and, and says, come on. And so we're like, we're, we're with her. So we just walk in. We're going all over the White House. Like she took us to the press room. We took pics, like we were giving speeches, you know, all the fun stuff. And we went into all the rooms. And we, then we, we went to the kitchen. And, and then we go down. We were told, well, you're not going to get like in the West Wing. I mean, that's not, it's all locked down. You're not, and so we're there. She's talking to all her friends, coming in and out. The door is kind of swinging open. She, and she's pointing out, here's the West. And she goes, ah, oh, come on. So we go into the West Wing. We're walking all around. We see the, like the whole White House. I mean, we didn't go like the president's suite or anything, but we had full access to the White House, all because of an unexpected invitation. And so today we're gonna, as you hear, what you've heard, we're talking about the shepherds who themselves got an unexpected invitation to the greatest party that's ever been thrown. And here's the thing, as we've been doing throughout this month, looking at Mary, looking at Joseph, now the shepherds, next week the wise men. God is inviting you and me to the biggest party there will ever be. 
which is living our lives in the kingdom of God. And so if you get an unexpected invitation, here's what you do. We're going to learn from the shepherds in uh, Luke chapter two. You can turn there now to verse eight through 20, Luke two, eight through 20. We're going to see that here's what you do. You get ready, you get excited, and then you get moving. The most important uh, aspect will be this third point. Now, this is a story that a lot of us know, but what we're trying to do is get you inside historically what this must have been like. Real people encountering the Spirit of God, being invited into the story just like you and me today. And many of you know, we just got back, a group of us, I see some of you here, got back from Israel. We went to Bethlehem. I mean, we sang at the Church of Nativity carols and we saw Bethlehem, which is about five miles uh, just south of Jerusalem. Now, you know, kind of, Jerusalem kind of spills over and you don't really know, oh, now we're in Bethlehem. But there is uh, still, there are still hills all around Bethlehem, around Jerusalem, where you can actually see shepherds abiding over their flock. Uh, We saw some ridges that are on the hills, which is interesting. And we were like, what is this? Like terraces. And it's the animals, sheep and others, that make these little trails, make these little pathways. And we saw, we saw shepherds out watching over their flocks and such. So I'm having this image in my mind and I want to paint a picture for you. Who are these shepherds? First thing I want, to, I want you to see is when you get an unexpected invitation, you got to get ready. You got to get ready. Look at verse eight. It says, and in the same region... Okay, now, Luke has already given us, first five verses, a historical context and geographical context. So in the same region, this is around uh, Bethlehem. Around Bethlehem, again, just between Bethlehem and Jerusalem. There's an area there called the Shepherd's Field. And I believe that, given my studies and such, that they were in Shepherd's Field, right there between Bethlehem and, and Jerusalem. There were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. Now, I want to get, who who are these people? Sure enough, shepherds were seen as really kind of low-class individuals. Now, I don't know that they were one step away from being homeless, but they would have been living in tents, likely. Uh, They had sheep on land that they did not own. And uh, what we know about them is that they were kind of looked down upon. They were a bit suspicious. They weren't like high-class people, but is unfortunately sometimes the case. The ones who really looked down on them were the religious elite. Those who were supposed to be so close to God, but uh, any Orthodox Jew would have probably thought, hmm, these guys aren't all that. They're not scribes, they're not Pharisees, and, and they're just normal everyday people. Now, imagine this. Uh, Some people have noted they're likely watching over sheep that would have been sacrificed at the temple. I believe this is true. Um, We know through Josephus, a Jewish historian, that if you know anything about about, about Jewish uh, rituals, high and holy days like Passover, uh, Day of Atonement, they had daily uh, rituals of sacrificing lambs at the temple for, for their sin, right? Some have noted, uh, scholars have noted, especially at Passover, you had a gap of time, afternoon, just the afternoon of Passover, where Josephus tells us thousands of lambs would have been slaughtered, killed, taken back, because every family, right, had a lamb, the Paschal lamb, the Passover lamb for, for the Lord's Supper. I mean, for the, now the Lord's Supper, for the Passover meal. And, and so there were thousands of sheep around this area and I'm guessing it seems to make sense these are likely temple sheep Um, also some scholars have noted I don't want to kill your Christmas vibe but Jesus was not born on December 25th could have been but more likely given my studies again I think as some have argued strongly likely in the springtime I think it would be just like the Lord to have him born right about Passover time where you have all of these sacrificial lambs out. Jesus comes, is born, the Lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world. But it says they're watching over the sheep at night. Now, again, that's not so unusual, but could it be an indication? Think about it. These shepherds had to tag somehow the firstborn lamb. So you're watching, if it's during birthing season, they are watching closely over what's happening and taking care of those sheep so they're not lame or injured or hurt in some way. They had to be the best they could be. So the point is in all of this that we could say about these shepherds, 
they're really just ordinary, normal people like the rest of us. And they are just doing their job. They're day, I mean, the daily grind. And they're, they got the night shift. They're not expecting anything like what's about to happen. The significant thing I want you to see, they're just blue collar workers. They're just people like you and me. Now, God does have an affinity for shepherds. You know this. Why does he choose shepherds? Of all people, there's a lot of reasons. One, you know, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, they were all shepherds. Jesus comes. He is the good shepherd, right? God is the shepherd. And we were described as sheep in his flock. And his sheep, he says, know my voice. They know the voice of the shepherd among all the voices that you and I have coming in our hearts and minds, in our brains, and that we're allowing into our heads. God still speaks to us and he speaks to his sheep who listen for his voice. The key learning today, they weren't ready necessarily, but my point here is this. If he shows up to shepherds, He's showing up for you and for me. We can be ready. We know a bit more than they did. Watch what they learned. Look at verse nine. You know the story. An angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory, okay, his holiness displayed, glory of the Lord shone around them. That's generally with light, brightness, and they were filled with fear. They're terrified. God chooses shepherds. Now, remember this, if you've been with us, the first one to recognize Jesus, um, even in utero, before he's born, the first one who realizes that he's come was who? Do you remember this? John the Baptist. Unborn baby. Says, filled with the spirit in the womb. And his mother, Elizabeth, formerly barren and older woman, filled with the spirit, realizes what's happening here. Spirit of God speaks to her and she says to Mary, now, Mary already knows. Mary has, has gotten the word, right? But she says, um, an older woman, the first to proclaim out loud what God is doing here. And, and, and then we see Joseph who joins in the story. And today, the shepherds, next week, the intellectual elites, pagan group of people who come to say, where is this king that's been born? What, what is the point here? This has struck me this Christmas, Advent season. If God comes to all of those people, here's why they were chosen in the story for us. He's come for all of us. He's come for every single person. He's come for all types of people. He's come for the whole wide world. And he's coming for you. He's coming for you today and he longs to come to you over and over again. We can be ready. Are you ready? Are you positioning yourself to hear from him? If anything, they may not have been prepared or ready. They were quiet. They were just doing their daily thing. But if you feel like your life is just kind of normal, daily grind, if you feel like you're nothing special, maybe you feel unqualified. Maybe you feel disqualified. Maybe you feel that you don't have a lot to bring to the table. You're in good company. Because the shepherds teach us that you have not been forgotten. That God sees you as he sees these shepherds. But we've got to stay ready, friends. How do you stay ready? It's positioning yourself before God. What does that mean? I know what it means for me. When I get quiet and I focus in his word and pray and listen to the spirit speak. Listen, here's what happens. He speaks. Now I don't have angels showing up, but he speaks through his word. When I'm too busy running, doing my thing, trying to prove myself, validate myself, he doesn't. Oh, he gets my attention in sometimes really painful ways. But when I sit before him and listen, I hear his invitation. Come, come to me. Let me me remind you how much you're loved. That's what our Christmas devotionals are all about. Have you been taking time with the church family? Just a little simple moment to be reminded as we were today when we lit the candle. Are you, are you coming before him? 
This coming year, you're going to hear a lot more about this, particularly on the 8th of January, but be prepared. We're going to be walking through Scripture together as a church family throughout 23. Not, not a read through the Bible per se, but we're going to have Scripture that we're going to be reading that are going to align with our sermons every Sunday. We're calling it dwell, just to dwell in His presence, to dwell in the Word. Imagine that. Every person in our church and friends are invited in. In the Word, reading the same passage every single day throughout 23. That will change us. That will transform us because we'll all hear from God. So Travis, like, like me and like Travis, we, we, we got the invitation and we got ready. But then the next thing, I want you to look at this. Get excited. Okay, get excited. Look at verse 10. And the angel said to them, fear not, always the case, right? For behold, okay, look, I bring you good news. That's the word euangelion, that's gospel. I bring you the gospel of great, that word mega in the Greek, literally, mega joy that will be for all people. He's saying, let's go. This angel shows up, okay, and he says, fear not, because you need to get excited. There's good news coming to you, and it's for everybody. Now, let's be honest. Some of us, you're hearing this, and y'all know I just kind of stay excited. But, but a lot of us, this time of the year, and I get it, I've talked to, just this morning, I talked to a family whose, uh, whose mother and grandmother passed away just a week ago, unexpectedly, tragic death. In... I know that there are many like them who are going into this Christmas season and it has been blown up. And some of us are experiencing Christmas for the first time without a loved one. Or maybe just some of us are just like, you know, Christmas is too much for me. What has become? Too much money. Too many activities. Some of us wrestle with social anxiety. Too many parties, too many people. I don't want to go to another thing. Some of you feel that way. And I want to say this morning, that's okay. It's okay. God continues, though, to invite you in. Because here's a word for all of us, regardless of what's happening in your life. This is news to get excited about. It, 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 it may be old and ancient, but it is brand new all the time because God is calling us. Remember what he's done for you. You can get excited about the fact that he's come to rescue you from your sin. Every single one of us. Look at verse 11. For unto you is born this day in the city of David, another clue, a savior who's Christ the Lord. Only here in scripture do we see all of these descriptors right here of Jesus. He's, he's the savior, he's the rescuer. His name, Yeshua, you may know, means what? God saves. He's Christ, which is the Greek word for Messiah. He's the liberating king. He is the Lord. He's the leader over everything. And we come to him and say, Lord, you're the leader of my life. You're Lord of my life. And he, just like King David found in Bethlehem, Jesus is found in Bethlehem of the house of David, fulfilling all of the prophecies. Look at verse 12. And this will be a sign for you. Look at this, a sign. What is that? That he's the Messiah. This is the sign. You're going to find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths. Okay, nothing unusual. Lying in a manger. Unusual. This is a stone carved out, likely. Stone uh, carved out for, for, it's a feed trough, right? And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God. We sang it earlier in, in, in Latin. Glory to God in excelsis Deo. And on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. Look at it, it says, a, a sign. You're going to find him. And this is what, what you're going to see. Notice the angels, it says, they, they appeared. The angel appeared. And then a multitude. Now, it doesn't say. It doesn't say they're singing, by the way. It says saying. But it says praising God. So we think, okay, they're, maybe they're singing. That makes sense. An army of angels. Get ready. Are you positioning yourself to hear from God? Get excited. This is the best news that, that has ever come to earth. And then finally, let's land with this. Get moving. Get moving. Here's what I want you to see. If these shepherds had not moved, 
This whole story for them would have meant nothing. Look at this. Look at verse 15. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go. Let's go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste. They went immediately and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. When God speaks to you, when do you obey? Immediately. You start to move towards what he is saying to you. Here's the point I want you to see. The power of God is not activated in your life The spirit does not come upon you for you to see all that God's doing until you act, until you move. I mean, imagine the shepherds, and some of us do this. I'm believing everything that I'm seeing right now. Jeff, what you're saying, I'm believing. Help me with my unbelief, but I am convinced this is true. What are you going to do about it? We've already talked about getting before the Lord. We've talked about moving. We're going to talk here about as we close. They go and tell everybody to invite others in on what God has done. To go share the gospel. To invite people here to come to church. To invite them to coffee or to lunch. Even today to just talk about Jesus. What are you going to do? A lot of us are saying, man, I wish God would show up in my life big time like this. This is great. I wish that he would reveal himself. He's been kind of silent. I've been waiting on him. I've been, no, no, no. God is waiting on you to move. It'll happen this week. A person, you say, well, I'm going to open the door for this person. No, they're all right. They, They got it. Miss out on the blessing. This person doesn't look like they belong here. I, I bet you they feel... I'm going to go reach out. I'm going to walk across the room and I'm going to talk. Nah, maybe not. Not until you move. Some of you have been thinking about joining our church. Can I say it? For some time. And, and, and not unlike Larry, myself, uh, who, who had been, Larry's been a member here for lots of years. There was a time when all of us who are members here decided I'm going to make the move. And can anybody testify to the blessing of what it has meant in your life and what it has done in your spiritual life? What you have seen all because you accepted the invitation. Anybody testify? Praise be to God. So some of you are here today, frankly, and it's time. Move. Some of you, like like those who were baptized this morning, they moved. And they stepped into what God is doing. Listen, God chose unexpected, imperfect shepherds to say, you are invited in now, but you've got to move. Look at this, verse 17, you know what happened. And when they saw it, okay, it, what is it? They isn't like saw him. No, it, the sign. They saw it. They made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. They went out and told, they went and told Mary and Joseph, here's what the angel said. He's Christ the Lord. And Mary's like, okay, some of y'all are finally getting on board with this thing, right? We know this. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. They wondered because they opened their mouths and they amazed everybody. And then I love this verse. I always love this single verse. Mary shows us the way, doesn't she? But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. In the midst of the busyness of this season, just calm, slowing down, listening. Lord, speak to me. Speak to me. Look at verse 20. Shepherds returned, glorifying, praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. Friends, here's the thing. Revelation 3.20 says this. Jesus says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him or her and he with me. See, some of us, you're thinking, I've already responded. I've said yes, I'm in. Like I said yes to Jesus. I'm a believer, like I'm I'm saved. Listen, that, we often use that in, in evangelistic terms. That verse is for the believer. He's speaking to the church. Can you imagine the church outside knocking on the door trying, and Jesus says, about time, come on in. I've been telling you. He wants to have an intimate relationship with you. This is the picture of 
eyeball to eyeball, heart to heart, knee to knee, toe to toe, with him. And today, if you feel like, man, I I don't have a lot to bring to the table, I'm not worthy, I feel disqualified, you're in good company with the shepherds because we all are there. Have you responded to his invitation? Because it's going out and he's asking you to come in. And have you received Christ as your Lord and Savior? I'm going to close with a story. I don't often do this, but out of one of my favorite books of all time, it's called What's So Amazing About Grace? You know, the story, uh, Jesus tells two parables, one in Luke 14, where he says, hey, there's there's a guy who invited a bunch of people to a banquet and they all said they had something, they were too busy. They, they, they had, uh, they're, they're preoccupied with their possessions, with their profession, and with their people. Like, like they didn't have time, all lame excuses not to join in on what God is prompting even you to do today. But listen to this story. Matthew chapter 22, verse 1 through 14 is retold by Philip Yancey in his book. And he writes this, an article from the Boston Globe about an unusual wedding banquet. Accompanied by her fiance, a woman, went to the Hyatt Hotel in downtown Boston and ordered a wedding banquet. The two of them poured over the menu, made selections of china and silver, and pointed to pictures of flower arrangements they liked. They both had expensive taste, and the bill came to $13,000, which would be a drop in the bucket for some today. After leaving a check for half the amount, As a down payment, the couple went home to flip through uh, books of wedding announcements. The day of the announcement, uh, the day the announcements were to to hit the mailbox, the potential groom got cold feet. I'm just not sure, he said. It's a big commitment. Like, I think we should spend some time thinking about this a little longer. Well, when his angry fiance returned to the Hyatt to cancel the banquet, the events manager could not have been more understanding. The same thing happened to me, honey. And she said, and went on and told her story about her own broken engagement. But about the refund, she had bad news. The contract is binding. You're only entitled to $1,300 back. You have two options. You can forfeit the rest of the down payment, go ahead with the banquet or Uh, Yeah, or just go ahead with a banquet. I'm sorry, I I really am. It seemed crazy, but the more the jilted bride thought about it, the more she liked the idea of going ahead with the party. Not a wedding banquet, mind you, but a big blowout. Ten years before, this same woman had been living in a homeless shelter. She would got back on her feet, found a good job, and set aside, uh, aside a sizable nest egg. Now she had the wild notion of using her savings to treat the down and outs of Boston to a night on the town. And so it was in June of 1990, the Hyatt Hotel in downtown Boston hosted a party such as it had never seen before. The hostess changed the menu to boneless chicken in honor of the groom, she said. (laughs) And and sent invitations to rescue missions and homeless shelters, not unlike our men of Nehemiah. And that warm summer night, people used to peeling half gnawed pizza off the cardboard, dying instead to chicken cordon bleu. High waiters in tuxedos served hors d'oeuvres to senior citizens propped up by crutches and aluminum walkers. The homeless took one night off from the hard life on the sidewalks outside and instead sipped champagne and ate chocolate wedding cake and danced to big band melodies late into the night. I'm so moved by that story. And I think we all are because, listen, that's our story. This story cuts right to the core, to a deep memory within each of us. God is inviting us back to him. He's inviting you and me back to the garden, back to the way it's supposed to be, intimacy with him. He's asking us to come. So so Travis and I, we got this unexpected invitation. We got ready. 
We got excited, but we got moving. And because we got moving, we got to see right inside the White House. Now, here's, here's what's fun. We could only do it because I said, we're with her. Friends, listen, the only way you can stand before a holy God, the only way that you enter into heaven is by coming before God Almighty and saying, I am with him. I have received Christ as my Savior. He is my Lord, and that's the only reason I'm standing here. Your good works will not do it. Your knowledge will not do it. Your hopes and your dreams or your maybe some days will not do it. You've got to receive Christ because in Romans 5, 1 and 2, it says, Therefore, if you have received, since we have been justified by faith, not our works, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we also, look at this, have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice in hope, the glory of of God. Praise be to God. You can receive him today, friends. If you have not, here's what's interesting. There was a show on television uh, at the time called Corey in the House. I don't know if you've seen this show. It's about a kid who lived in the, in the White House because his dad was, was a cook. He was the White House cook. So Corey in the house. And Travis and I are watching that literally at, at our hotel room that night. And we're going, it doesn't look like that. <laughs> We've been to the kitchen. It doesn't look like that. That's not, that's not the way it is. Friends, listen. Not until you step into this life of faith do you see things as they really are. You have access in. You see the glory of this life that he's given us, the grace of God. And then he starts to show you things you have never seen before. And it all starts when you take a move of faith to receive his grace. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for your grace today. And we praise you for how you come to rescue each of us from our sin. So we give you our lives. We, we, we fall before you. We worship you because of this invitation that you've given to us friend receive his grace now just say yes to him this baby has come for you he grew up to live the perfect life for you because you couldn't he died on the cross for your sin receive him now say yes to him and enter into a life where he will reveal all that he has in store for you and then someday you and me praise be to God we will be with him in glory for the big wedding feast of the Lamb. Lord, we love you and we thank you for your grace today. What can we do but respond and tell others about you? We pray in Jesus' name, amen.